You know, you've, you've probably heard about that thing called the 10,000 hour rule. You know, uh, uh, you know we, they talk about the Beatles going to Hamburg. They weren't really a great performing band until they would ship over to Germany and they had to play eight hours a day, six hours a week, uh, six days a week. Can you imagine playing eight hours a day and then six days a week and then knowing that the kids that are, or the people that are coming into the club, you have to entertain them because the, because the owner is, is screaming at you because if they're not buying beer, nobody's making any money. So they had to come up with, well, we better learn how to play this song or this one might work or we better write a song like this or how can we get their attention? Maybe we'll write a lyric like this. So it's really writing and performing go hand in hand. And the more you practice that, and it's so funny with our, with our you know, advent of all this technology where people are sitting at home going, oh, I can just hit this button and all of a sudden I'm the best drummer in the world. You know, part of me is like, that, you know, that is, and people become great at that and that's okay, but, but there really has to be this connection between your, yourself and your audience. And, um, the, and the best practice is to actually take it to the people. So if, if, if I was in a young, if I was a, you know, if I was, uh, let's say, 18 and I was about to start a band, I would get a rehearsal space and I would try to write the best 10 songs I could write. And then I would go out and I would play those and I'd record them, make them sound as good as I can, and then I'd go out and play them. Then I'd come back and see, and after I played them to a bunch of people, I would see which ones were the best. I would take the best three, throw out the other seven. Then I would write another seven. And then I would keep doing it until I, until I knew that I had 10 songs that were so great that no matter where I played in this country, by the end, I had, if let's say it's a club of 250 people, I had those 250 people coming up to me going, when are you playing again? Because that is exactly how then the record companies take notice and, they, and that, that, that you've created that magic. Because now you're on a ride and you've, and you've created your fans because they want to follow you because they go, they feel something when they hear your music. And you know, I'm producing Dave Matthews Band now. There, it's a great example of, I think they broke in 94 or 5, something like that, 93, 94. And um, so what is that, 16 years ago, 15, 16 years ago? And they started playing in clubs, and now, even with their occasional record, which they haven't made as many records as, as you might think, people want to follow them. Uh, people pay a lot of money to go and see their, you know, they'll go do, they come to Los Angeles, which is a tough market, and sell at the Staples Center two nights in a row. Uh, it's 20,000 a night, that's 40,000 people. Um, and online they have all these fans, and all that was was, that, was was what I just described. Let's write a bunch of songs and play locally until we get a following. They used, to, they used to be able to sell out the club, I forget which club it was, but they were telling me just the other day that they would sell out every Tuesday night for about four months they sold out their local club. That's because on Tuesday nights something was going to happen. A new song, you know, they, they captured the imagination of the people. You know, if you get your MySpace thing and you get your 250,000, you know, streams and, um, and people are interested in what you're doing, it's just literally another extension of, of what you're trying to build. And I probably shouldn't have left that out of my original description because those first two things are actually the most important thing. Because if you, if you notice, what you, if you go on MySpace, most people, they'll put the song on, but, if they're, but they'll also, the next thing they'll put on is the video of the show. What are they, and the pictures, what do they look like? You know, because it is an image too. It's, you're, you're selling a sound, you're selling a melody, you're selling a lyric, you're also selling an image. Your image should go hand in hand with the sound of your band. It's like, it, it's the simplest thing, but it's the hardest thing in a way. Uh, what I, I've never wanted to have, I never thought that the idea of being a record producer was to then insert your sound into the band. Mine was the opposite. Mine was to look at the band and enhance what they do. So, um, that's why I think if you, can, if you listen to a Green Day record or listen to an Eric Clapton song that I did or an Alanis Morissette song or a Phil Collins or a, a, or a Green Day or this Dave, whatever it is, or, or uh, My Chemical Romance, for example, um, what I do is I actually really go into rehearsal and I watch what the band is doing. I actually almost use my eyes first. 
and I see how the guy is playing, and I see what they're playing. What ki why does he put the drums like that? You know, because you know Bob Breyer has his drums flat, kind of like the way Keith Moon had, and um, the guitar player has what one of the guitar players in My Chemical Romance has has it almost. Uh, Oh, I'm having brain damage. The guy from Queen uh, has a Brian May kind of style. He can actually do all those runs and riffs. And and uh, Frank, Frankie in in, uh, in, my, in My Chemical Romance has has a really cool alternative sensibility. And he can play real choppy, chunky. He's always playing something cool that balances off the almost muso sort of thing that the guy in uh, uh, that um, ah, brain damage <laughs> that the other guy is playing. And so. Then what I do is I go, well, how can I capture this? What, what's, what do they do? I look at the essence of what they're doing and I really think about it. Like, um, well, uh, how do you record that kind of guitar playing with that kind of guitar playing with this drummer and this singer? What will make it be the best? What's the natural sound that's coming? Then I, then I use my ears. What's the natural sound that's coming out of this band? Um, and then I apply all the technology to enhance it. So really, my answer is, it's the band that tells me. I run it through my filters, right, of what I think the band is doing, but it's the, but it's the music and the musicianship that tells me what to do to enhance their sound. That's why I don't sound like... That's why I, I, mean, that's, that's why I think I keep getting rehired, is because I help them. You know, I'm not, I'm not out to promote... Uh, like me or my sound, I think that sucks. I think I know that there are producers that can do that, and that's very good because they're kind of half in the artist world. I'm probably like a quarter in the artist world, or maybe an eighth. Where certainly there's an artistic thing that I do, and I can help bands a lot with with chord changes or or ideas or whatever it is that happens. But really, my goal is to, and my desire is to get them to be great. So that's kind of how I do it. I hope I answered the question. <laughs>